and hear from the wise son, but I'm kidding, of course. Um, in 1977, as a 7th grader studying the Holocaust in middle school, one of my closest friends told me during lunch in front of what seemed like the whole school that Hitler should have finished the job. I recall a lot of oohs, like as if everyone was expecting a fight to break out. I felt helpless and alone. And not one friend, Gentile or Jew, came to my aid. In retrospect, this boy who had been my friend for years was really echoing something he was being taught at home. A highly educated and affluent one at that. I learned firsthand as a 12-year-old that the anti-Semitic impulse was not dead. A week ago today, I returned from a mission to Poland and Israel as part of the UJC campaign chairs and director's mission. Our guide in Poland was Wexner, faculty member and Holocaust historian Deborah Lipstadt. In three exhausting days, our group was taken dip deep into the abyss of what remains of the desk camps, still surrounded in barbed wire fences and guard towers. I walked along the train tracks, into the barracks, through the gas chambers and the crematoria. I witnessed the ultimate result of anti-Semitism, the machinery of genocide that nearly annihilated European Jewry forever. Despite the green grass and warm summer air, it was the grim reality of the crushed bone and ash of our ancestors literally under my feet that helped me conjure up the misery and despair, the filth, humiliation, the horror, the loss of hope, the loss of generations, and most painful of all, the memory of over one million Jewish children, no different than my beautiful children, put mercilessly to death. Our group, worn out and dispirited, flew directly from Krakow to Tel Aviv. Upon landing, our morale returned because we knew we'd soon be witnessing the height of human achievement that is the living dream of modern day Israel. One cannot take that journey without increasing one's resolve to fight the menace that is anti-Semitism and for that matter its evil twin, anti-Zionism. But in the same breath, one's determination to fight must never overshadow the reason to fight, our essence, our rich heritage, the gift that is Judaism however you define it and practice it. In Poland, Professor Lustad spoke of Jew as subject versus Jew as object, an idea that really resonated with me. For the majority of Jewish history, Jews lived as objects, living and dying under the rule and the whim of others. Although our people certainly had periods of great peace and prosperity, they were regularly interrupted by the worst kinds of crime. Despite all of this, these periods produced astonishing achievement in scholarship and nurturing of faith. But it was not until 1948, with the founding of the Jewish state, that in my opinion, Jews in Israel and Jews in the diaspora finally became the subject of our own story. May 14th, 1948 marks the moment in history where we shift from two millennia of Jewish turmoil and weakness to Jewish power. As an American Jew, I choose to exercise this power. We all must, for the Jewish contribution to the future of humanity is too great, and the debt owed to our ancestors is immeasurable. It is my obligation to act. I will not abdicate it to others and suffer the consequences. I arm myself with knowledge, political clout, and financial muscle to promote this ascendancy. So armed with these tools, how do I exercise this power? Like all of you, I'm deeply involved in the Jewish community and the secular one. I live in Berkeley, California, which brings its own unique challenges. <laughs> this is a community where bumper stickers on luxury cars call for an end to the Israeli apartheid. I'm face to face with these bumper stickers every day. I also serve on the city, city's Peace and Justice Commission, which is a whole other discussion some other time. <laughs> it is here where I square off against the most vocal of critics. In order to better understand my neighbors and be certain of my own convictions, I have tried hard to understand why some progressive, both Jews and Gentiles, are so critical of Israel. More troubling to me is the criticism that is cloaked in the protective cloth of Judaism. 
When these Jewish critics write letters to local papers, they often begin with, I'm a Jew, as if that makes the position uncontestable. Legitimate criticism of, of any political system, including Israel's, is of course part of, healthy, of a healthy democracy. And as we know, Israelis themselves make a sport of this. But I'm speaking of a different kind of criticism. What confounds me is that much of the criticism coming from progressives ignores the values that Israel is built upon and continues to aspire, which are in fact bedrock progressive values. It also astounds me how some are so quick to critique Israel's failings while not scrutinizing the other side under a similar microscope. For example, the United Nations is particularly guilty of having issued dozens of resolutions condemning Israel while turning a blind eye to poverty, corruption, human rights abuses, and even genocide. Is this a double standard? Is it anti-Semitism? Is it both? A lot of criticism of Israel, particularly from progressives, can be understood if we consider what David Hartman has written. written. I quote, Israel expresses, Israel expresses the courage of the Jewish people to dream within the concrete, to live actively, knowing we all live in an imperfect world, and that the people responsible for guiding Israel are also imperfect and limited human beings. Critics from the progressive ideology have an expectation that Israel will act with higher moral authority, but they fail to understand that Israel exists in reality. On the day of its founding, Israel was drawn into a conflict where conventional rules did not exist against an enemy who was not interested in negotiation. If the Arab world accepted Israel's existence from day one, she never would have been drawn into wars, occupation, security fences, and checkpoints. The things critics like to complain about, none of it would have been needed. As we know, the original two-state solution was offered to the Arabs and the Jews 60 years ago. Only one party accepted it, and that brings us to the current situation. As I look out at this room, I know we are not who the enemy says we are, and nor is Israel. I know that we are productive, highly principled people who seek to better our world. Little, if anything, would please us more than to see the Palestinians with a homeland and Israel once and for all at peace. But what more can Israel do? Israel has offered everything, but is constantly terrorized by suicide bombers, cross-border kidnappings, and rocket attacks. Palestinians and their supporters single out Jews for, in Israel for annihilation. It seems incomprehensible. For any of us to sit idly while militant anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism spreads across the globe would be unforgivable. When it comes to our survival, we must all seize the moment and do our part to right these wrongs. Is making Aliyah the ultimate Zionist expression? I say yes. However, I admit that we all can't. And in fact, I believe many of us shouldn't. Here in the diaspora for 2,000 years, despite the horrendous obstacles, Jews did survive. As odd as it sounds, despite the unbearable struggle, it did make us stronger. Perhaps, in the end, the diaspora somehow saved us. Now, in the 21st century, Israel needs us to be deeply embedded in the diaspora where Jews may flourish, and we remain vigilant, powerful voices ready to speak up for her. Now I'll come clean. If it was an obvious already. The organization that fully captures my values, my beliefs, and my dollars is APAC. I won't use this time to explain to you why I'm so passionate about APAC. You may ask me privately if you wish. But I will say this. Had there been an APAC in 1933, we might be having a very different conversation right now. I'd like to challenge all of you as I challenge myself nearly every day. Are you doing enough to ensure, to, to ensure Israel's survival? What are you doing to ensure that your children live as a subject of their own lives and not the object of someone else's? In one of the first readings we were assigned in this amazing program, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg wrote that, after the Shoah, world Jewry learned two primary lessons. First, that we are one people, united in faith, and dependent on each other to restore and protect the value of Jewish life. Second, that in order to live and uphold Jewish dignity, there is no choice but to re-enter history and take power. This is precisely what the Wexner Heritage Program has empowered us all to do.